Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Coalesce. My name is Ben Warshaw, and I lead partner operations uh, at DBT Labs. I'll be the MC of this session. Uh, I'm excited to introduce uh, Pratik Chavla, founding engineer at Monte Carlo, for building a data platform from scratch with DBT, Snowflake, and Looker. A few notes to keep in mind. Uh, all chat and conversations uh, and Q&A will take place in uh, Coalesce building a data channel uh, in the DBT community Slack. This is going to allow us the chance to connect with the remote attendees of this session tuning in from around the world. If you're not a part of the DBT community Slack, um, you can join now. It's not too late. Uh, community.dbt.com and search for the channel when you enter the space. Uh, if you've already joined this Slack channel for the session, uh, go ahead and take a sec to introduce yourself, connect with some of the other community members joining us. Uh, and for New Orleans attendees, please be aware we are about 30 seconds ahead of the folks watching online. Uh, so try your best to refrain from sharing any spoilers in the chat. After the session, um, Pratik will be around in the Slack channel for an hour or two answering other questions, um, but we do encourage you to ask, um, ask away when they come up. So let's get started. Over to you, Pratik. Thanks for that introduction. So today, as I mentioned, we'll be covering building a data platform from scratch. A um, little brief overview of what we're going to be covering today. So we're going to talk about what even is a data platform, talk a little bit about Monte Carlo's initial data platform, talk about how it's changed, evolved, things we've learned, and how it's improved, and then kind of talk about where data, data observability fits into all of this. Uh, please let me know if I talk too quickly, which people have told me I do. All right. So before we get started, let me do a quick introduction on who I am. So I'm Pratik. I'm the founding engineer and principal engineer at Monte Carlo, where I kind of help drive technical strategy for our data observability platform. Previously, I was a technical lead at Barracuda, working on email fraud prevention technologies. And I graduated summa cum laude from UC Santa Cruz uh, and with a bachelor's in BS. And in my free time, enjoyed doing things like uh, watching Broadway shows, flying airplanes, reading books, and traveling to new places, and meeting fine folks like you. Um, and then th for those of you who are unfamiliar, Monte Carlo is a Series D uh, data reliability startup that basically coined the term and category of data observability. We provide an end-to-end -end coverage solution that integrates with various many data tools across your different data stacks to try to cover the entire data lifecycle. And we've had the fortunate experience of working with many, many customers, and the list is growing every single day, including Fox, Pepsi, JetBlue, Vimeo, and so many more, to try to bring reliability to their pipelines through proactive monitoring, alerting, and of course, lineage. All right, as promised, what is a data platform? So for most organizations, building a data platform is, something, is no longer something that's just nice to have. It's becoming more and more of a necessity. I think companies really distinguish themselves based on their ability to glean actionable insights to improve the customer experience. So this means like getting better revenue, um, you know, getting more information, and kind of help defining their brand. So in a nutshell, a data platform is really just a central repository and processing house for all of your data. It handles like the collection, the cleaning, the uh, transformation, application to generate useful business insights. So of course, the right data stack will really vary based on your business, like a 5,000-person e-commerce company or a 200-person startup or maybe a 10-person startup like what we had back in the day will look very, very different. But there is like an overall blueprint that you can follow, and all of these data platforms kind of mesh into the same one way or another. And I'll try to lay that out for you. Cool. So let's walk through some of the components. I've outlined, I think, some of the core components that make up pretty much every data platform. Like I said, not every single one will have everything, but generally you'll, you'll see these, little, these components. So the first one I want to touch on is ingestion. So as the case of pretty much any modern data platform, there'll be a need to ingest data from one system to another. This eventually might end up being like your ETL or ELT pipelines or architectures at the end of the day, but you need to start somewhere and you need to get data, right? Um, there's lots of popular tools you can leverage to like help you make your lives a little bit easier, like Fivetran, Stitch, Kafka, Kinesis. All of these can like make this process a little bit easier, and you can always you know, explore building your own custom tools and custom code to ingest data from your both internal and external sources. One important thing with ingestion another, and kind of the overall data platform is you should consider orchestration and workflow automation. And there's lots of tools to help you here too, like Airflow, Prefect, and Dagster. All right. So the next thing I kind of want to touch on is data processing and storage. So um, this, is, this is kind of really the heart of your data platform. I did talk about the ingestion layer first because it's the entry point, or it might actually predate your data platform like it did for me. You might have the ingestion layer already created before you actually create the full data platform. 
Um, so like its namesake, it, this is kind of where your data is stored and processed and can be like a warehouse, a lake, or some mesh of the two. Um, and there's lots of different options that you can consider when you're building your data and storage processing layer, like Snowflake, um, Redshift, BigQuery, and Databricks. Lots and lots of other technologies that can help you on your journey here. And then the next part is data transformation and modeling. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this. That's kind of why we're all here. Um, there's a popular tool that kind of helps with this. I'm not going to mention it, though. Um, and it consists of taking like the raw data and you know, cleaning it up and applying business logic to get it ready for downstream users. And the downstream users really here are your business intelligence analytics tools. When people think of a data platform, they really think of your BI tools. This is like the cover of your book. This is what most of your consumers are using. They're, they're using some degree of like BI layer to build reports and meaningful insights. So it, 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 you can do like the fanciest transformations in the world. You can make it look nice and pretty and be very eloquent. But until you have a BI layer or some sort of presentation layer, there's no end user and there's no insights to generate. So this is very important to consider when you're like planning to create your data platform. And there are lots of tools and technologies out there again, like you can use Looker, Tableau, Mode, build something in-house, right? And then the last two are kind of um, data observability and data discovery. And I'm going to talk about these two together. They kind of try to eliminate the um, data downtime and improve the health of your overall system. But we'll dive into those a little bit later. Okay. So what was Monte Carlo's initial data platform? Well, that was it. So before, before we had anything, this is what it looked like. We had a S3 bucket. And was data was ingested through Kinesis. Uh, we, had, we had some jobs on Databricks that took that data, transformed it a little bit, ran some business you know, logic, did some magic, and dumped it back into S3. And then that ended up in our application. So we, had, we kind of just had all of this. And for anyone who's kind of worked with data, you probably already know this, but this was not really a good long-term option. It wasn't very scalable. It wasn't maintainable. And it was just, come on, it was just a, it was just a blob storage, right? So at the, at the same time, we were trying to like, um, build out our data team. We were kind of expanding and growing. And the need came for like a proper platform. So I immediately volunteered to take this on. And for some context, I'm not a data engineer, analyst, or scientist. So this is not my field. I'm more of like a back-end developer or a cloud developer, because that's kind of where I spend most of my day. So this was all new to me. So I'd worked with, I'd worked with our customers. And I'd you know, worked very close to building out our application on this. But I never created one myself. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to not only dog food our own product, but really discover the pains of creating a data platform like firsthand. I thought this, this actually really one of the things I really love about being at a startup is like you can try on these like many different hats. So you can you know explore this one day and do this the next day. A uh, backend engineer can build a data platform. Um, and it's just a really good experience and you can really like learn and grow. So that's what I did. I read like multiple blog articles, I read about best practices, I watched YouTube videos, I talked to customers and people I know in the industry who are much more knowledgeable than I, and I kind of put something together and this is what I had. So let me show it to you. So this was the first data platform at MC. So we still had that storage layer. We had that beautiful bucket. We actually have a couple more of them now, so it's not just the one monolith. Um, but we had this storage bucket, and we introduced a data warehouse. So we researched a bunch of different options. Like We looked at all the different bleeding warehouse technologies, and we ended up going with Snowflake. I'm happy to talk about why a little bit after the session. But, uh, and to connect to, to Snowflake, we leveraged external tables. So these external tables were really easy to set up. They were very simple, and we were able to connect basically our streaming storage layer directly to our warehouse pretty easily. Like it took a couple hours to build up just that, and boom, we had a warehouse, and we were ready to go. And you know, in a startup, you have to hit the ground running and move very fast, right? So we had our warehouse, and we had this, we had these, we had this like kind of raw, unstructured data in our data warehouse. Um, so then, what was my question? Came, what do we do with it next? Well, actually, I thought about that before designing it. I didn't implement it before, but in this scenario, what to do next? So I looked through different technologies and different things we could use, and then I discovered, of course, DBT. It helps you define transformation as code. And to me, as like a back-end engineer, that made so much sense to do. You can use version control. You can use CI, CD. So it just appealed to me. You can do all the things I would normally do, because to me, the data world was the Wild West. You were just People were defining things, they were creating tables, nobody knew what roles were, nobody knew what users were. People were just creating things willy-nilly. And I didn't like that, and I didn't want to allow that to happen here. Um, so I love DBT, and I'm thankful I discovered it and it exists here. And we leveraged it, and we kind of followed a very st straightforward you know, architecture from there. Where we had our raw external tables, they were transformed into staging or silver tables, and then you know, they were turned into gold tables and ready to use for downstream users, like our BI tool. 
Everyone also had their like personal DBT schemas, and to tie it all together, we introduced an Airflow scheduler. So the DBT also has a great ability to like run and schedule things, yes, but we wanted to schedule things outside of DBT as well, and that's why an external scheduler really appealed to us. So we have, we had, uh, so a big part of Snowflake external tables is you have to refresh them before you can use them. So our Airflow scheduler would refresh the table before it was usable, then our transformations would run, and then some downstream applications would use it, and we'd have that all DAG nice and managed. We kept our lake around, and we still use Databricks a ton. Uh, we did clean it up a little bit too, but instead of using raw S3 files everywhere, like pushing you know, S3 back and forth, we started leveraging Delta tables to keep it more organized and structured. And yes, over the, so this, was, this is what it looked like when we first introduced it. And yes, the data platform has changed, and we'll touch on some of the big things that have changed, but the overlying architecture has kind of stayed the same over the last two years. We kind of still have this like, very general flow. There have been, you know, we've hired actual data engineers and people who know what they're doing, and they've made vast, vast improvements to it, but it generally still kind of looks like this, which I think is very cool. Um, Oh, sorry, one more thing. We also did leverage DPT Cloud. I think DPT Cloud's also really useful here because it let us kind of run these jobs without having to manage infrastructure. And that was really appealing for us because um, you, know, you can spin up like instances and stuff like that or clusters to run DPT jobs. You can maybe even run them on your scheduler, but it was nice to just have a service to kind of offload that work for us. And that's why DPT, really appealed, DPT Cloud really appealed to us. Same for having like an IDE to use, so like newcomers could have an IDE without having to like spin up things locally, and that made it a little bit of a nicer experience for like our data analysts and scientists for the first time. Uh, just to get them onboarded really quickly, we wanted to use, we wanted to have a mechanism where they didn't have to like install a bunch of dependencies and deal with all of that day one like setup basically. All right. Cool, so now this is kind of where the data platform fits in MC. So I just want to provide a little bit of context on kind of the MC platform. So we take data from like data warehouses, lakes, BI tools, and orchestrators. We collect like metadata, metrics, stats, and other log information, and we collect this all via a data collector. So this data collector is an agent that's deployed per customer. You can deploy it in your VPC, we can host it for you, whatever is convenient to you. We collect this information at different cadences, and all of this information ends up in our data monitoring system. System. And this data monitoring system powers three core components of our platform. It powers our data reliability dashboard. So that's that nice fancy UI you'll see that like, you know, lets you cool, do cool things. Our reporting system, which you know, alerts you about issues. So you get Slack messages, pager duty, webhooks, however you want to know about a data incident, we probably support it. And then our programmatic access tools. So we want to be programmatic first to be you know, very developer friendly. So we have our API, we have our SDK sitting on top of that, we have a CLI, and we have our own Airflow providers and infrastructure as code to kind of like help you use our different resources. But, but, but data monitoring system at the end is kind of powered by more traditional things. So we have like Elasticsearch powering the search, and we have like a you know, Postgres database powering the database. But you see in that little corner, that's our platform. So that's where our analytics and detectors live. This is where we generate the useful insights and detections and all the you know, machine learning magic that our amazing data team works on. And it all gets, kind of follows that same workflow and it ends up in our database and there's like workflows between the two back and forth. And obviously we've added new sources, like we have internal analytics and we have a bunch of other stuff that's kind of expanded. But overall, that's kind of where the data platform fits overall in MC. So what's changed in our platform? So, so we've had both like technologically specific improvements as well as kind of nice general purpose learnings. First of all, we started leveraging Snowpipe for ingestion. This is a very Snowflake-specific technology, but it was a great improvement because external tables were really nice to set up, really easy to set up. Like I, like I told you, I was able to set it up in a couple hours without having a clue what external tables were. Right? But Snowpipe let us, manage, let us leverage managed tables, which made our transformations much more faster because you were no longer reading from blob storage. And Snowpipe was actually pretty easy to set up too. And a lot of other warehouses hope something similar. So I think that's a, it was a good like, move quick architecture where we did external tables, they were fast to set up and they did the job. And when we were ready to expand and we, were, we needed performance and we needed like, more throughput, we were able to leverage a tool specifically built for that. So now we have managed tables as our entry point. We also started leveraging dedicated job clusters also known as Snowflake warehouses. So in Snowflake, you can kind of spin up warehouses for different jobs. That's one of the big advantages of it, where you can separate compute and storage. We obviously did use different snow warehouses for purposes, like we had like a research cluster, we had like a, uh, you know, a dev cluster, a BI cluster and all that. But we learned that we should also apply that to every job. So each job kind of had its own warehouse, so they didn't have to compete over CPU. Pretty obvious in hindsight, but something we learned. <laughs> 
Um, we also limited the scope of jobs. So our first job was dbt run everything. I'm sure most of you know that didn't last very long. We, in fact, still have a job that does something similar to that. We call it multifarious in honor of the original. Like, It's just a very fancy way of saying miscellaneous. You had to use that SAT skill somewhere. So we have this multifarious job that kind of does some of that. But now we have like jobs that do more dedicated, specific things. I think that was a big improvement there, too. We also started leveraging more and more incremental models, which are more complicated to set up. There are some things to know about like backfilling and things like that. But it's very nice because they, again, improve the speed of most of your pipelines. Because instead of having to load like the 100,000 rows again every single time, you can, only, you can only really have to load the delta, which makes it very, very convenient. Another one, from, at least from my, data engine, from, my, from my back end side, is we started leveraging more and more infrastructure as code. We actually did this through Terraform. And now any resources not created in dbt are codified. So we can have managed dev and production environments. And we can kind of recreate things and have like a good source of truth. So we have like roles defined, we have snow pipes defined. Uh, when we create like different things, infrastructure as code is the way to do it. And then part of that was adding more fine-grained access controls. Cool. So now how does data observability fit into this? So I guess before I talk about observability, the question is really, why is testing not enough? Because dbt has this awesome ability to test. There's multiple extensions. Why is that not sufficient? Why do I need observability too? So the big thing is data changes a lot. There are these unknown unknowns, which what I mean by that is that there are things you cannot predict. I can write tests for things that I can think of, but there are lots of things that I can't think of. And that's where observability matters, because I can't test for a variant that I don't know or I have not understood. I, if I know a specific condition, all this must be true, great. That's a good test candidate. But again, like I said, you can't think of everything. Another thing is there's a lot of debt in testing. Like, you'll never hit 100% coverage, no matter how much you want to aim for it. And honestly, even if you hit 100% coverage, you still can't fully rely on it, because it's very easy to hit that 100% metric without your tests actually understanding the nuance of what your code is doing, right? So even if you have that beautiful 100%, you could still have poor tests that don't actually you know, take into account all the different things that could happen. And scaling tests is kind of hard. There's a lot of cognitive load to it. Having 10 tests, fine. Having 100 tests, fine. Thousands and tens of thousands of tests that you don't know what to do and how to deal with them. It's just it's complicated from a, from, a, from a thought process point of view. And also setting them at reasonable thresholds this requires a lot of understanding of the data. Like, you, you, how are you supposed to know what absolute number to always use? Like, that makes sense. Like, OK, it's very easy if my null rate should always be 0. I can set an absolute number there. But what if I have some fuzziness in that and can have like a 10% you know, null rate? What about now is it like when the data changes, 10% becomes 11% and it breaks. But you know, the data might be just fine. So it's hard to take into account stuff like that. And then end-to-end -end coverage is critical. So dbt does a still a really great job of like the test that dbt runs. But what about what's upstream of dbt and downstream of dbt and all the other data resources you use? I'm sure big data teams know they just you leverage a lot of technologies, right? So you need coverage there as well. And then kind of the next thing is providing impact and context, right? If a test fails, the first immediate question is, so what? What do I do? How does this matter? Who wrote this? And why, why, did, like, why, why should this matter that this test, like, why is this test paging me in the middle of the night? Like, then does the null rate have an actual consequence? Or was it just you know, something that's like, I don't know, right? Because I didn't build it, or I wasn't involved in it, or you know, a developer three years ago wrote it and kind of moved on with this day. Right? So that context is very important. And then, of course, you can't always define things in SQL. You kind of have to leverage other technologies as well every now and then. So kind of introducing the concept of data observability. But one more little uh, sidestep before I talk specifically about observability is I want to reintroduce the concept of data downtime. So as defined here, it's really periods of time when your data is partial or erroneous, missing, or otherwise inaccurate. It Basically, as your data systems become more and more complex, you have an endless like sources of you know sources, consumers, producers, and whatnot. So for you know engineers and developers, this data downtime kind of means wasted time and resources. And for consumers, it really just erodes your trust, right? Like, and you can't make decisions on things you can't trust. And that's kind of why we collect all this data, right? It's not just for the transformation; just to make smart decisions from that data, right? So data observability tries to answer that, because it's, it's like an organization's ability to fully understand the health of the data in their system. It tries to eliminate this data downtime by applying some of these best practices learned from DevOps and um, data pipeline observability. 
So what's going on here? So it's kind of just like a, oh, it's kind of washed out, but there's a pipeline there. <laughs> um, so you, there's kind of a lack of a holistic or end-to-end -end visibility in your entire data pipeline from your data to sources. So whether it's your warehouses, your lakes, your BI tools, or your different orchestrators, you kind of don't have this like context, which is what's missing. Luckily, there is a solution. It is kind of, uh, and we can actually steal it again from the world of engineering, um, where basically uh, kind of they've kind of already solved this problem to some degree. We have a lot of technologies and tools that kind of help prevent and like your app pipelines. You know, you have like Datadog, you have New Relic, and so on and so forth. That kind of work to make sure your pipelines, you know, what's going on in, with them, but you don't actually know what's going on inside of them. Right, so we can kind of leverage some of the same like learnings and understandings from that, and kind of as as you know things grow more and more complicated, it's more and more critical to do that. So, at, you know, at its core, for those of you who aren't familiar with observability engineering, it's kind of based on a couple different like pillars or metrics. So a major pillars. So the first one of those is metrics. Then you have traces and logs. So metrics kind of refer to a numeric representation of data measured over time. Traces are like casually related events in a distributed environment. And logs, I'm sure all of you have spent some time with logs, are like a record of an event at like a specific timestamp and give you that context you need. So it's really the same kind of in the data world. We have three different components. You can detect, you can resolve, and you can prevent. And in order to do that, uh, we've kind of come up with five different pillars that kind of benchmark your entire data's health. Freshness, distribution, volume, schema, and lineage. And I'll talk about all of them. Yeah. So the first pillar is freshness. Freshness really seeks to understand how up-to-date your data tables are, as well as the cadence at like, which tables are updated. And it's really important to decision making. It's like if you have something that normally updates at a specific schedule, and there's a gap in that update, anything reliant on that during that period of time is not something you can necessarily trust because an update was missed, right? Next up is distribution. So distribution is really a function of your data's possible values. So if your, data, like if your data is within an accepted range, and it gives you an insight into whether or not your tables can be trusted based on what's expected from your data, right? So let's say you are like, uh, you know, you're, an, you're an app developer or something like that, and you're tracking different iOS versions, and for whatever reason, an Android version shows up in there. That's probably wrong, right? Something in the pipeline got messed up, and the distribution helps you catch things like that. Next up on the docket is volume. So volume is really the completeness of your data and offers insight on the health of your data sources. So you know you had 500 million records here, and all of a sudden, 269 million of them just dropped. Probably should know something happened here, right? Because as you can see, this table very rarely gets deletions. Um, next up is schema. So it's like the organization of your data, or is kind of can, can indicate broken data. Of course, schema changes don't always indicate broken data. Schema changes are a natural part of an evolving data system or data pipeline where you can, you know, your things are expected to change, but it's nice to know and be able to have like this context, right? Especially when you're like thinking of downstream and upstream users, because you could make a change very upstream into a pipeline and the actual impacts for it could be, you know, 10 nodes downstream, right? So those, this, this schema change lets you capture that, hey, something happened up, upstream of you. And similarly, before you make downstream changes. And last, but definitely not least, is lineage. So lineage kind of prevent, gives you the context. So I talked about like this upstream and downstream. So lineage is kind of that where. Where did it happen? Who was the producer? Who was the consumer? Why does it matter? And it can be used for a lot of different things. It can be used to to, to deal with incidents after the fact, and it can be used to make proactive, smart decisions. So if you know your entire pipeline, down to the field level even, you can know that modifying this field or making a change here will impact three tables downstream and make a change to your BI fields. Let's say you change a very like innocuous change, like you change a string to int or whatever, right? And it's fine for you, but someone might have been using that or expecting that in a specific format. And if, it, if their pipeline breaks, that's actually good because then you get, you get notified that something is wrong. The scary times are when it doesn't break and it just kind of passes through silently and then you find out about it like three weeks later when your CTO or CFO sends an email like, why is my dashboard wrong, right? So this tries to catch those type of things. So, it does sound a little counterintuitive, but breaks in those situations are actually a good thing. Um, cool. So that's like a lot of stuff to keep track of. Um, so I'm going to insert a little bit of a shameless plug here. Um, so enter Monte Carlo. We kind of try to provide like a holistic or single pane of glass across all of these data assets. So like I said, think of like a new relic or data dog for application observability, but now for the data world. Uh, we use machine learning to try to understand the normal conditions of your pipeline and to raise alerts and insights to provide you tooling to root cause analysis. We also try to under understand context and impact without you having to define anything. 
Um, so, you know, no code solutions. But if you do want to do specific things and, you know, apply business logic or things on specific monitors, we provide the tooling to do that as well. And, of course, we integrate with dbt. Whether you're using dbt cloud or dbt core, we connect with both of them. And we can kind of merge this into, again, that single pane of glass, provide more details, and check out our documentation here about that. All right, one more plug, and I'm done with plugs. Um, we're also hosting our own data conference, Impact. It's our annual virtual data observability summit. And we'll actually have Tristan Hardy, DBT Lab CEO and co-founder, speaking about the, mo uh, the future of the modern data stack. So you can actually RSVP with this code. And I really hope to see you there. I'll leave this on for a couple of seconds and then jump over. All right. Cool, so that's kind of it. So let me just give you some key takeaways of what I talked about. So most data platforms designs share a few core layers. That's kind of like that blueprint I mentioned, right? And you, your data platform is and should ever be ever changing. You can't predict everything, so you gotta come up with a design that's flexible enough to adapt. You're not gonna get it right in V0. You might not even get it right in like V10. But you gotta build a design that's adaptable and it's able to change as your needs change, right? Nothing is static. And as we've seen, data downtime does have measurable impact, but luckily there are some pillars of observability that can give you a little bit more of a holistic view um, to, to like deal with these type of data incidents. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm Pratik again. If you have any questions, let me know. All right, thanks Pratik for a great presentation and thanks to all of you who joined us here in the room and virtually. Uh, if you have any further questions uh, or would like to send comments to the speaker, again, the conversation can be continued on Slack, uh, the channel you see up there. The next session in this room is going to be modern data management, how to set up your data for success and it's gonna start in about 15 minutes at 5.30 Central. See you there.